To some technique, all right. Um, technique is always a little bit tricky because everyone's hand here in Zoom universe is shaped different, right? Different size, different length, different width. So if I could put everyone's hand here exactly where I hit mine, and we're all going to get a different sound, right? It's not like a drumstick. And I'm not saying drummers drumming is easy at all. There is technique to drumming. But if I give you a drumstick and you hear the cymbal, it's going to crash, right? If you take your hand and hit the drum, it might not even make a sound, right? Uh, just how a drummer has to practice and, and get the sound they want with the sticks, even more so with your hands on the drum, OK? But the good news is there are some starting points and some tips and some places where, OK, this is where you place your hand. This is where you experiment until you find what works for you. All right? Because just how the conga gets played or you have different rhythms throughout Central, South America, and everywhere, there's different technique and different formula to generate the sound depending where you go or who teaches you. So we'll start here. Just your open tone. Just to get that sound. How do I do that? So here's where you start. So I'm, I'm gonna try to put my hand closer to the camera. It might be a little 3D action here, but what we're gonna do is this. I'm gonna turn my hand around and there's two sets of knuckles I refer to when I'm teaching this to a student. You have the knuckles you use to knock on your neighbor's door and the ones you use to punch. Now turn your hand back around. The knocking knuckles, the punching knuckles. In between there is where you strike to get an open tone. Meaning the rest of this finger from the middle up shouldn't touch the drum. Okay, that's for something else. So if you're gonna play or you're gonna get behind a hand drum, and this applies to djembe, this applies to bongos, this applies to a lot of hand drumming. To get an open sound, here's what I do. I'm gonna try to, hopefully you can see in the camera. I will put my hand kind of centered on the drum and start to back it up, start to back it up until the knuckles, remember the ones we used to punch, you can kind of feel them if you, if you go on your hand in here. You want them to rest right on this edge right on this edge of the conga. You don't want it to fall off the cliff. You don't want it to go over. When you feel the edge of this drum kind of up against these knuckles, you stop and look at your hand. That's generally your starting point to generate an open tone, okay? That's your starting point. It's not with your hand falling off over here. It's not if your thumb is all the way in, you're not gonna get it. Your thumb is typically resting behind typically resting behind and again when these knuckles when you feel them just snug on that edge you stop that's your starting point what do you do from there make sure you're straight your elbow should be at or below the tuning rim All right not the edge of the drum but the tuning rim because if i'm sitting way up here i'm not going to get a good sound if I'm sitting way down here, the, your, your technique's gonna be off, right? So the posture and the height of your seat or the stand that you're playing standing up is very important. Once you're there, the position we talked about, and I'll try to do it sideways so you could kind of see, but when I strike my fingers, I could slide another finger in here. That's how I'm striking. It's not flat, it's not flat, my fingertips, should not hit the drum. So I'm gonna try to go maybe sideways a little bit. So this is my hand flat, but when I strike, I'm right here. And there should be a rebound. Just like a drumstick, you don't hit a tom and just leave it pressed up against the drum head. 
it bounces back. Your hand should do the same thing. If you get this sound, you're using fingertips. You're killing your own sound. You're killing the old, the overtone. It should be. You should hear kind of float in the air, right? You should hear it ring, open, open tone. Very important to everything you practice. I'm right-handed, so I have to sometimes work harder on my left, right? Because it just doesn't come out sometimes. And these are called single strokes. This is a very important exercise. Some, you know, some I practice to this day. Sometimes at a, maybe a faster tempo, but you're sitting and hitting your drum and getting the sound is one of the most underrated things a hand drummer could do. Because they feel once I found it, okay, next, and they forget all about it. Always got to come back. That's your open. If you want to, now there's the next thing I'll talk about is slaps. There's a few different types of slaps. So we just did an open tone. I went to an open slap. You hear the contrast and noise? I, I'm hoping it's sounding okay to the speaker. Do you get an open slap? Do the opposite of an open tone. Now it's all fingertips. Meaning, when I strike the drum, I should be able to stick my, my thumb or another finger in between because you're kind of making a little bit of a, of a pitch at your punching knuckles, right? So when you strike the drum, you're leading with the fingertips. You're leading with the fingertips. So it's going to come down. And none of this should strike the drum. It should just be the fingertips for your slaps. Okay? Open, again, you're hitting from the middle knuckle to about here. Somewhere in there is your open. Okay? And I like for the open to try to focus my impact between my middle and ring fingers. Somewhere in here. It centers your hand. Because sometimes what happens where your opens, you start pivoting. And you don't realize it and you're hitting it like this or you're hitting it like this you want it nice and flush flat your hands horizontal to the floor parallel to the floor right for open for slap then you want to practice opens against your slaps you want to hear the contrast in the sound you want to be able to hear it both hands Let's say four each, right? One, two, three, four. Let me tell you, just doing that will probably take a month or two. Legit, right? To be able to do that on command is not something that if you sit with a teacher, you're going to walk out of there playing. Not going to happen. It takes a while. I mean, I would, my parents can attest, I'll put on a Bears game Sundays with a conga. All four quarters. Trying to find it because it takes a while. And sometimes you find it by accident. On how, but how do you repeat it? How do you make it consistent, right? Because if we're going to play, it's got to be on command. So it's got to be something where I could set out a drum now, open, got it, open slaps, close slaps. The way you play that is, again, the open slap fingertips, but you still get the rebound off the drum, like in the open tone, right? So it's still coming off the drum. A close slap, your hand stays, doesn't rebound off. So you have open tone. Open slap, close slap. Okay. Same idea. Fingertips, you want it to be, again, I like to go, I was taught between the middle finger and the ring finger to keep your hands flat 
and you keep them keep it on the drum this is used in wawanko a lot that little shuffle is a close slap sounds too ringy it's like for some reason everyone teaches it as a close slap so that's one of the extra patterns i use to teach the close slap because it's always going to be there um but yeah so we've talked about a little bit about the open tone open slap close slap one more is the muff stroke which is using Pretty much your whole finger, and no rebound. You want to kill the sound. A lot of rumbas, when they start, that's what they're doing. You'll hear. Right, that whole intro, it's muff. They're not. They're doing. That one again is it's similar to an open open stroke, but no rebound. You keep it on the drum. Open stroke, right? Muffled. All of these come into play when, when you learn one of the other. Remember, I said uh, while I'm close, like first or second in the patterns you learn. The other one is tumbao. So it's always either tumbao or wawanko or wawanko and tumbao. Those are always one and one A. So we'll go through some tumbao right now. Um, and it incorporates opens, it incorporates slaps, okay? Um, and what we haven't talked yet about, which is this motion, heel toe, heel toe, okay? I'm right-handed, so when I'm playing tumbao, the heel toe is going to be on my left. You're striking with your dominant hand, okay? Um, when you start it, it, it's a two-bar pattern. Even though it kind of repeats, when you put the thumba in, it becomes a two-bar pattern. And the thumba is always going to be on the three side. We'll get to that. But when you incorporate the thumba, when you go here, it's always on the three side. If you're playing traditional... Son or Montuno, son Montuno, okay? But this is, I'm going to play Tumbao and then go back and break it down. All right, so one, two, three, four. Okay, what was all that? So, now start it slow. You're gonna start. The first movement is this. It's heel, toe, slap. You leave your left hand on the drum and you do a close slap. So one, two, three, four, heel, toe, slap. One, two, three, four, heel, toe, slap. Four, heel, toe, slap. Three, four, heel, toe, slap. That's the next one. Heel, toe, slap, toe. Heel, toe, slap, toe. So after that, heel, toe, slap, toe, you go back, heel, toe again. Heel, toe, slap, toe, heel, toe. Heel toe, slap toe, heel toe. Heel toe, slap toe, heel toe. Heel toe, slap toe, heel toe. One, two, three, and. One, two, three, and. One, two, three, and. One, two, three, and. One, two. Heel 
toe, slap toe, heel toe. Up to that, that's where most people get mixed up. They all know at the end, right? But heel toe, slap toe, heel toe. One and two and three and one and Just cycling that, you're playing tumba. How to incorporate the tumba? Where does it go? Okay, we'll get to that now. So, once we're able to play through a tumba, and I'm gonna count out loud so you could see where it falls within the within the measure. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four. One and two and three. One and two and three. One and two and three. Because you still do this on four and, right? One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. Two, three, four, one, two and three, four and one, two, three, four, one, two and three. on the three side of the clave, all right? If you're doing variations or it's more of a funky tune or some song goes, you'll put it on the two. But if you're playing like a salsa tune or a song or anything in that tradition, a cha-cha, guajira, and you're playing this, this goes on the three side of the clave, right? Within this pattern. If there's a break, obviously that's different, right? You could hit it to do a break or whatever, but it within your pattern is on the three side. I know we mentioned some dancers, so, so I want to throw this out there. I'm not much of a dancer. I'm pretty bad. My wife can tell you I'm boring. But there's a correlation between this drum and the dancing stuff. But I see a lot of dance instructors when they're teaching. Let's say before one of my gigs is a salsa dance instructor. They're doing one, two, three, five, six, seven. One, two, three five, six, seven, and those are the steps. One, two, three, five, six, seven. One, two, three, five, six, seven. If that's where you're dancing, remember that that little gap between three and five is where I play. One, two, three, five, six, seven. One, two, three, five, six, seven. One, two, three, five, six, seven. One, two, three, conga, five, six, seven, conga. One, two, three, conga, five, six, seven, okay? That's always, and again, there's variations which may pull that away, just how there's many variations of dancing that I don't even know exist, right? But at its core, when you're teaching it, one, two, three, five, six, seven. One, two, three, five, six, seven. So if you're ever lost in the music, that's a clue. You know where, if you're hearing this, one is next. One, two, three, five, six, seven. One, two, three, five, six, seven. I know there's another way to dance, which is called on two, which I believe, Patrice, you're nodding, so tell me if this is wrong. The first step is on the second beat of the measure. Correct. So instead of dancing and stepping uh, one, two, three, five, six, seven, it's two, three, four, six, seven, eight, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. If I were to dance, that's how I would dance. Why? Because that locks in with this and with the bongo player and with the timbalero. So if you're dancing salsa, Learn on two, and here's why. The conga accents beats two and four. So I'm gonna start clapping, counting, dancing on two, and show you where my accents are. So two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, 
six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, six, seven, eight. That slap, not only does the conguero accent it, the bongo player accents it, the timbalero, someone's on bell, that is where we lock in. If you're in a percussion, the modern ensemble, which is, let's say, a conguero, a bongo player, a timbalero, even a drummer, that two, beat two, in every measure, needs to sound like one person, right? So if you have three guys on percussion and you're, you're all gonna hit on beat two, you can't sound like, everyone's gotta sound like one punch. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. no matter what you're playing, right? If you have a timbalero and a bongo player on bell, they're playing two different patterns, but that beat two needs to sound like there's one bell and it's got to lock in with the slap of the conga, right? If you're, if you're on bell, all that locks in. When you're another percussionist, remember, as a percussionist, especially in, in Latin music, you're playing eighth notes. This is just eighth notes, one and two and three and four and one and two. The timbalero is playing eighth notes. The bongo player is playing eighth notes. They got to lock in, right? You got to be able to have the ear to hear, you know, the phrasing, how he's playing it. And it's got to sound like one person playing everything, right? The bells, two bells going at the same time, it's got to sound like one, right? And they got to lock in with this guy. They got to lock in with the bass player. Because the conga player also, most importantly, has to lock in with the bass player, right? We share some of the same hits, and I set up his pattern. So if we're talking bass real quick, let's say a traditional bass pattern would be one, two, three, four, boom, 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 boom. So I'm hitting that beat four with him. That's got to lock in. And my beat two has to be on point to set up his and. Because he's playing the and of two and the downbeat of four. So we need to set that up. Same with the piano player. He's got to be locked in clave wise with the bass. And many times what you end up seeing is in some of the, the more ensemble sections, when the timbalero or drummer is on bell, the piano montuno sounds like a bell pattern, right? So the piano montuno is almost mimicking what the timbalero is playing on his bell, right? So for them to play together, you got to know the clave, you got to know the feel, right? And all that comes back to playing together, playing as one. Anytime there's a hit, you know, or, or an accent, it has to be sounding like one person doing it. Right? You don't want the hearing flams on it, you know, that's not intended. Everything's gotta be, you know, it all has to lock in. Locking in. That's the hardest part of any band. Locking in, you know, getting a, a feel for some of the guys, getting a feel for how they phrase, um, and then just getting together and locking it in. Okay. Um, okay, there's a question from Trevor. There certain notes you tend to tune to on the conga. Does it depend on the genre for you? Great question. I traditionally do try to stay with my tumba around a G, my conga around a C. And if I'm using a third drum, um, B flat ish, and I is, I'm not sitting here with a tuner, right? But a, a quick test for me is let's say I show up to a gig and let's say they happen to have some congas there, and for the, whatever reason, I don't have much time to tune. I do, here comes the bride, that's the interval I want. Everybody knows, here comes the bride. So 
that's the interval. If you're playing other music, for example, if I'm playing merengue music, yes, tune them higher. Um, and, and more uh, salsa and Puerto Rican music, C and G work out for me. If I'm playing pop music, I also tune a little higher. Um, gospel music, I tend to keep it around the C, G, B flat, stuff like that, more uh, contemporary music. But um, it does depend the genre. Not that you're going to be wrong if you don't, because there's times you're on the gig where it's Latin and, you know, other music. I'm not going to be, you know, tuning to every song, right? So typically around a G, around a C will do the job for you. But that's what I and um, on most recordings that I hear back from congueros I follow and I, and I enjoy listening to, that's about the same tuning they use as well. So it's pretty universal to be around a G, around a C. It doesn't have to be exact. Like, again, I don't tune before uh, every gig, right? But if it sounds, here comes the bride, I'm typically in good shape, okay? Say, say, oh, yeah, 